This is PT Pro Talk, the podcast for physical therapists who want to improve their clinical skills and be more successful. I am Mariana Parks, physical therapist and your host, and today I bring my conversation with Michael O'Hearn about running injuries. We talk about pacing during training sessions, how to select the appropriate footwear for running, running mechanics, and insights into treating injuries like IT band syndrome, patellofemoral pain syndrome, plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendinopathy, medial tibial stress syndrome, and many more. Michael is a PT with over 40 years of experience, a board certified orthopedic clinical specialist, and a fellow of the American Academy of Orthopedic Manual Physical Therapists. Michael is also faculty with the Maitland approach and with Northwestern University. He is also a runner himself, participating in 13 Boston marathons and many others. If you find this conversation interesting, please subscribe to our channel, hit the notification bell for updates, give us a thumbs up and share with other clinicians who could benefit from this conversation. Thank you for tuning in and we hope you enjoyed the show. PT Pro Talk is only possible with the support of the forward-looking and innovative companies like Systems for PT, the Do Anything Anytime EMR. Systems for PT develops systems for clinicians so you can focus on your patients. Go to systemsforpt.com to schedule a demo today. Sarah Health. Remote therapeutic monitoring sounds great, but also difficult. Sarah Health makes RTM simple and easy for your patients and providers. Check out sarahealth.com slash ptprotalk for a special offer. Hi, Michael. Welcome to PT Pro Talk. How are you today? Good. Thank you for having me. Awesome. I'm glad to have you here. And so let's get started talking a little bit about yourself and your background. Um, sure. Um, it's pretty long. I mean, I, I'm a physical therapist or in Australia, I was a physiotherapist. I went to the University of New South Wales in the Cumberland College of Health Sciences, and I started working in 1983 was my first year of practice. So I've been practicing continuously since then. I moved to the U.S. in 1992. Um, in those days, there was a big shortage of physical therapists and um reimbursement for physical therapy was really good so hospitals and everybody else saw that saw rehabilitation as a very good income stream at the time not so much now yeah yeah exactly so I came and I was only going to come for two years and I've been here ever since um since during that time I've I taught I think for 16 years I taught a class at Andrews University in Berrien Springs Michigan on spine um, I've taught at the University of Illinois at Chicago in their fellowship program in manual therapy. And I currently have uh, a co-terminus position at Northwestern in their fellowship orthopedic physical therapy program. Um, yeah, so that's it. So it's 41 years right there in a nutshell. Yes, a lot of years. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. 41 years. Yeah. Yes. More than yeah. what I'm alive. Yes. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I'm with a hospital system in Southwest Michigan called Caldwell Health. I've been okay. with the same group for the whole 32 years, actually, I've been with them. Yes, that's crazy. Awesome. Yeah, it is. Yeah, thanks. And so, and how about your start with Maitland? How did your involvement start oh, with Maitland? Well, yeah, that started when I was at, um, in, in PT school. I had Jenny McConnell as my instructor. Um, you know, she's famous for the, the taping and the, the patellofemoral taping, that sort of thing. She was my instructor. And that's all we learned. We just learned that was our textbooks were vertebral manipulation and peripheral ma manipulation by Jeff Maitland. So it goes right back to the beginning of practice. That's all I knew. I didn't know any McKenzie. I'd heard of him. I didn't know any of the osteopathic sort of stuff. Um, so it goes right back there. And then, so I, that was just what I first learned. And then in the early 2000s, I started teaching with um, Maitland Australian um, physiotherapy seminars. I do a little bit with them. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that's been, so you've been teaching for over 20 years now. Yeah, with the, yes, in the US, yes. About mm -hmm. 20 years, I would say. Very nice. And we also know about your background as a runner, right? Do you want to tell us a little bit about? Uh, your... Yeah, I used to run, you know, um, I used to run pretty competitively. I've run a lot of marathons. I've run the Boston, Boston Marathon 13 times. I've run the New York Marathon, the Chicago Marathon four times, and lots of other trail marathons and other things. Um, I've done a few Ironman triathlons. Um, I just get slower as I get older, but I still enjoy doing it. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. and I ran track in Australia. I was okay. I mean, it wasn't that good. I mean, I was okay at a sort of a regional level. Yeah. You know, it wasn't exactly national material or anything like that. But if you're just completely in triathlons and marathons, for me, you are an amazing athlete. Let's say well, that. Well, thank you just very to, much. Yes. Just to complete, we know how crazy those those can be. Is working as a PT on Ironmans. We were talking a little bit about that before yeah. the interview. It's just like a war zone after. So right. I just, yes, uh, I think it's very... Um, uh, how, what is the word? Admirable? Admirable, yes. Um, yes. People say, you know, why do you do that? And I can't answer that question because usually while I'm doing it, I'm suffering so much. I'm thinking, why am I doing this? <laughs> and then I finish it. And then two days later, I look for something else. <laughs> Crazy people. Crazy well, people. Yeah, as a psychologist say, there's the experiencing self and the remembering self. You know, the experiencing self says, this sucks. <laughs> and the remembering self says, oh, looks back and says, that was pretty good. Why did I do it again? <laughs> yes. So it, mm, anyway. Um, and then I'll have to ask you something uh, that Chris told me about your Boston Marathon. So you were there at that time of the bombing, correct? Yes, in 2013, I was, um, I had finished before the bomb went off and um, I had no idea what was going on because I, you know, I could hear the helicopters and I could hear the sirens and everything like that. I had no idea. I only found out about the bombing when my mother in Australia rang me to see if I was all right. <laughs> Oh, wow. She told me about the bomb. <laughs> and then, yeah, so that was my experience. Yeah. I heard you had a little angel running with you. Yes, I did, actually. Um, I had, I was actually, I don't know what was wrong. That was, see, that was 10 plus years ago. I think I either had plantar fasciitis or I was fatigued. I can't remember what happened, but. I finished the course early than I should have because some guy wanted to pray over me on the course. <laughs> a spectator. <laughs> he laid his hands on me and prayed, and that felt pretty good, you know. <laughs> so that got me <laughs> running again. And then I got to the top uh, about the 20th mile, and uh, it's near Boston College, and all these college kids were drinking beer, and one of them handed me a red cup full of I don't know what and then slapped me on the back. I drank that, and I felt pretty good too. <laughs> Wow, that's good. Right. Um, okay, so let's go to our topic of yes. running. So you know you have a lot of experience treating um, uh, runners, right? Yeah. So let's start talking a little bit. I heard your um, conversation with Chris in like a Facebook Live, and you mentioned a lot of things that I thought it was really interesting and to help clinicians that don't have experience treating uh, runners. Um, I remember you mentioning something about the pacing while you're training and while you're treating. Would you yes. talk a little bit about how important, because sometimes they ask, should I stop running, uh, you know, until I'm healed? Like, and we don't sometimes know what to do. So what would be your advice on pacing, running and stop running or continue running just slower or volume, all of that? Yeah, yeah. I think... With running injuries, the heart of the running injury or the, the root cause of pretty much every running injury is tissue loading, right? 
the mm-hmm. tissues, whatever it is, muscle, tendon, bone, has been overloaded and hasn't been able to adapt in time, right? And one of the ways of, and, and I think if you, if you can control that loading, modify that loading, you can make a, a big difference, right? You don't, instead of thinking of orthotics and which muscle is tight and which muscle is weak, et cetera, et cetera, the first thing I think the therapist should think about is loading. And one way of looking at loading, this is just one way, is just looking at how fast they're running, right? So a good question to ask, okay, everybody has a satellite watch now, right? They have a Garmin or something that tells them exactly how far they ran and how fast they run. Mm-hmm. A good way to start, I've found, is to ask the runner, is what is your 5K time? Okay, so five kilometer, just about everybody's gone in 5Ks, and if you're up running recreationally, you go on a 5K and you just see how fast you can go. And say you can run a 5K in 25 minutes, which is pretty good time. And that's either five minute kilometers or that's pretty close to eight minutes per mile, right? Mm-hmm. So since we're in the US, we'll talk about you know miles, miles and minutes, right? So then if if someone's running a 5K in 25 minutes, okay, that's eight minute miles. That's their pretty much their fast pace. So then the mm-hmm. next question is, is what should what are your training runs in? And if their training runs, well, I'm running 820s or 830s, well, that is way too fast, right? Their training runs should be more like 10, 10 and a half minutes per mile, right? So the mm-hmm. first thing you can do to control load is to get them to slow down, right? Mm-hmm. Too many uh, runners, you know, particularly in the early stages, Run a run a, a course, time it, and as they start to feel better, they try to improve that time every time, right? Mm-hmm. And they will go out and, like I said, just beat their time, and that just sets you up for injury. When in fact, mm-hmm. if you slow down, you would probably still get to the same goal without the excessive tissue loading. Mm-hmm. There's a, a good book that I recommend to a lot of people starting out running. The author's name is Matt Fitzgerald, and the book is called 80-20 Running, where he argues in the book that 80% of your running should be pretty slow and pretty easy, and only 20% of it should be harder, such as running at a 5K pace or faster. So that's it's t- tissue loading. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that, um, I don't know in the U.S. how it works, but like in Brazil, my experience being in a city that we have Ironmans, tri, tri uh, athletes, and a lot of runners, uh, there are a lot of groups with running coaches that would give mm-hmm. you like a, a, a plan to follow on your training schedule. I don't know if that's common in the U.S. or not. Uh, I don't have experience with that. Um, so... When you say that people just, you know, try to, when they're training, run as fast as they can, people just take that out of their heads. They don't have anyone kind of like advising them on how their training should be or pacing should be. What are your thoughts on that? Um, You can use, there are plenty of online plans that you can use. And Mm -hmm. there's, I direct a lot of people to Hal Higdon, that's, H-I-G-D-O-N, he has a lot of free training plans up online that lots of people Mm -hmm. have used to run half and full marathons. And he's pretty good at keeping people at running certain distances and picking the pace that you should run. Mm -hmm. Um, If we're talking about Ironman triathlon, though, that's a different type of running. I mean, just about every runner in training even on their slowest training runs, are probably going to run faster than what they do their Ironman triathlon run in because it comes after swimming for 3.8 kilometers, cycling 180 kilometers, and now you've got a 42-kilometer marathon on top of it. So they're coming out on very tired legs. Mm -hmm. So training for that sort of run is a little bit different. You have to be able to teach yourself to sort of run 
jog, move um, con- constantly on very fatigued legs. Mm-hmm. And like, do you feel your patients, runner, uh, runners, do they do they follow that advice of the eighty twenty, or do you feel like most of them don't don't have the knowledge of on how they should pace themselves? Um, yeah, they probably don't. The thing is, is they've got to trust you because their thoughts are that the harder I run, the fitter I'll get, right? Mm-hmm. So to slow someone down, sometimes it might they might feel like I'm not doing any good. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I'm not mm-hmm. getting the benefit that I was. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I'm not there's there's no benefit. I'm going too easy when in fact that that you do have that benefit there. And most people who run a lot, I mean, if you look at the Kenyans, you know, they're the fastest marathoners in the world. You know, they do a lot of really slow for them running. I mean, they're running four minute miles, right? For, you know, it's just between four and a half, or I think it's 440 to five minute miles in their marathon. But their training pace on their real easy runs would be closer to nine minute miles. So it's double, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if we get back to our 25 minute 5K person, that's like running 15 minute miles. So it's almost walking fast mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so the, the 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 challenge for the therapist is to is to get the the novel novice runner to trust that slowing down you can still get to your goal and i think most of them would like prefer to slow down um and keep running rather than say I, you should stop running mm-hmm. because that's the that's the last thing they want to hear is I don't want to stop running. Mm-hmm. But yeah. And, and how do you convince them per se? Or like, do you, um, you just talk to them or do you refer them to, you know, go look at those training plans and what would advise, would you advise clinicians to do with these type of patients that don't want to slow down? Right. So let's take a step back. You're going to have two types of runners here. You're going to have those that are running just recreationally, right? And then those that are going to be running competitively, right? So the recreational runner is the easiest one to deal with because they're more likely to adjust their program and take do cross training such as use an elliptical or ride a bicycle or swim or do weights. They're the easiest people to work with. It's the competitive person that has a big event coming up that thinks that they need to get all their 20 milers done in order to you know, be ready for that marathon. That's, so that's a harder group to work with. So getting back to that group, which I think is what you're referring to, um, usually you can use examples, I mean, historically, of runners that have run very well after having to have a break due to injury, you know, I ran my fastest Boston marathon quite a few years ago after being sick with a sinus infection and hardly doing anything for the two weeks before it. Um, and you know, every run has a story like that, but we don't trust ourselves enough for the next marathon to actually slow down. So I think they, there has to be a certain amount of trust between the the, the running patient and the therapist. Mm-hmm. So I don't quite did, I, I, you know, so it's a collaborative sort of effort. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So now changing the topic for shoes. So I think that's also a, a big topic that, you know, are appropriate. What, what shoes do you recommend? Are there any type of shoes that are, better than others or it depends on the running style so what are your thoughts on shoes uh pretty simple actually a a shoe is sort of like a pillow you know what 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 feels best for your head is probably the one that's best for you i mean there used to be a, a movement where 
you would sort of look at someone's running style and if they overpronated, they needed this sort of shoe or if they were neutral, they needed this sort of shoe or if they sort of landed more in supination, they needed this sort of shoe. You know, I think there was a research study which randomly assigned shoes to the different categories mm-hmm. and found that it didn't help prevent injuries no matter what shoe you wear. So the important thing is is to find a shoe that's comfortable for you, right? Now, shoes have gone all over the place in the last 10, 12 years. I mean, we had the onset of the minimalist shoe. Mm. Um, I'm trying to think what year that was, probably around 2008, 2009, where you had the the Vibram um, Five Fingers, which were those glove-like shoes that people were putting on and there was sort of a natural running shoe sort of movement going on you know where barefoot is best Mm -hmm. um and i think a lot of that came from that book born to run um do you you aware of that book Mm -mm. it was a book in and it was a book on run you know born to run i'm thinking christopher mcdougall is the author and it was a bestseller and it just followed some ultra runners and the Tarahumara Indians in the Copper Canyon of Mexico. And, and the book was sort of a reflection on running shoes, et cetera, et cetera. And so from that book, there was a big movement in, to, in people wearing minimalist shoes. So people grabbed the minimalist shoes out and then there was a super high incidence of stress fractures, particularly the second metatarsal because mm-hmm. people weren't, ready for the excess loading that the shoes were going to give you, you know, and they thought that the shoes would actually cause you to sort of run in a more normal gait, normal gait being landing more on a midfoot, forefoot sort of thing, as opposed to heel striking. Um, But that didn't seem to be the case. It didn't seem to change people's gait patterns at all. And then Mm -hmm. some people got injured and then started suing and, then we switch to the more what I call a maximalist shoes. The Hokers came out a few years after that, which was super thick and super padded and people gravitated towards those. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have the onset of the, uh, so the pendulum just swung from super thin shoes right over to super cushioned shoes. I think the answer is somewhere in the middle. But in the meantime, you have um, Nike came out with their um, Alpha and Vapor Flies, what they call the super shoes, and most of the companies have those type of shoes at the moment where they've got a carbon plate and a very, very thick springy midsole, and they're very, very light. And they're the shoes that have been worn for um, world records. Yeah, then they estimate they can reduce your marathon time by 4% or something, which is a big difference. Oh, wow. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, that was a long answer. Um, I think that the, 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 the shoe that's best for you should feel pretty good when you put it on. There's no breaking it in or anything like that. So, so it's a very personal choice. Um, if you've got an Achilles injury, um, I would recommend getting a shoe with a greater heel toe drop. That's the difference between the height of the heel at the back and then at the, then the forefoot, right? Because that'll sort of reduce tensile loading through the Achilles tendon. So there's a few things you can do there, but other Mm -hmm. than that, um, I would just go on comfort. Okay. And there is a lot of people that talk about using insoles right? Like for the pronation, supination, like the tennis that we have also like the shoes that are a little harder on the inside or the outside. Yeah. So in that sense, you feel like that doesn't make a lot of difference as well. No, I think like I want to get back to that tissue loading model, you know, Mm -hmm. one thing when someone's injured, you unload the tissue and then as it starts to heal, you start loading the tissue again, right? So that it will remodel and get strong. So, so if you're thinking of insoles or things to support the medial arch, that can be helpful in the early stages, right? Because it will reduce stress 
say so you've got plantar fasciitis and you find these insoles help, then I think they do have a short-term benefit. Mm-hmm. But that was only uh, only in the early stages. But I don't think there's any benefit, and someone might correct me if I'm wrong, of the different, you know, <clears throat> they used to be, they used to change the density of the midsole, the midsole, like the midsole might be more firm on the inside of the heel mm-hmm. than it is on the outside of the heel to sort of stop or slow down pronation. I don't know if they do that anymore, and I wasn't aware of that actually gave anybody any benefits. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and like talking about mechanics, do you uh, teach anything to your patients on like the, what is the best mechanics? Like we're talking about um, striking with the heel first or midfoot. Um, yeah. Do you have any advice regarding that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so you know, like looking at running injuries, step one is control the loading, right? Mm-hmm. And step two is then you can look at some things that may be causing why the tissue might be getting overloaded other than running too much, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so the running too much or running too fast is the first stage. Um. So we can look at tissue, you know, you can look at flexibility or mobility in the sagittal plane because running is a sagittal plane activity. You've got to go forwards. You don't go sideways. And if you're restricted anywhere in that sagittal plane, you're going to compensate by increased movement in the either the horizontal and or the um, frontal plane, right? Does that make sense? So you're yeah. going to start pretty much rotating and shifting. So the things I look at really is ankle mobility, right, was the first thing, okay, to make sure you've got adequate dorsiflexion. And a simple test for that for me is just asking them to do a squat and can they keep full squat and keep their heels flat on the ground, right? Mm-hmm. That's a just a real basic test of ankle mobility. And then the other thing I look at is hip extension, right? So have they got sufficient hip extension? I use Thomas's test for that to look at hip extension. And so that would be the they're the two they're the two main things is ankle mobility and hip extension. You could also look at first ray, you know, um, great toe extension too. I guess you could throw that in there as well. Because like I said, if you lack movement through that foot ankle and up into the hip, then you're going to be compensating elsewhere. Mm-hmm. And like in your experience, does it happen, like for example, they have full range of motion, but still the way they are running, their mechanic could not right. be good. Okay. Would you like analyze that as well, ask them to run? and think Yeah, you yeah. can have them run on the treadmill. That gives you a bit of limited information. Mm-hmm. The main thing I look at when they start running is I look at um, cadence or stride count. You're mm-hmm. looking at how many steps a minute are they taking, right? Mm-hmm. Now, the magic number is around 180, okay? So 180 steps a minute. Now, this is, this is you know, this is not hard and fast, but generally speaking, if a person is going to run faster, they, that 180 doesn't go up too much, but their stride length increases, right? That's how you get faster through increasing your stride length rather than increasing your cadence. So anyway, mm-hmm. so I would I count the number of steps and I usually just on a treadmill and I'll just do one leg mm-hmm. and um, I will count for 30 seconds on one leg, right? So you get one leg, 30 seconds, see what you've got, okay? So you should be for 30 seconds, you should have about 45, right, because it's just one leg. So the 180 is for both legs, right? Yeah, that sounds a lot easier. Yeah, yeah, so just one leg, count the right leg (laughs) and see how close it is to 45. Okay. Now, if it's a simple thing to do, if it's like 35, right 
And this is while they're running at a comfortable pace, right? Sort of like their training pace is then you just help shorten the stride a little bit. And that can do a lot of things in terms of, particularly if they've got knee pain, particularly if they've got patellofemoral pain, you can reduce the uh, patellofemoral joint compression forces by 30% or something just by actually increasing cadence, right? Have them take shorter steps, Mm -hmm. right? That's very interesting. Shorter steps, maintain the same pace. It requires a fair bit of thinking but it'll actually help a lot with the pain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I had then a, you are, you are causing less, you're, you're decreasing the load because you're reducing the Well, the, the cumulative length. load over the time is probably the same, but the impact loading is probably a little mm-hmm. less, isn't it? Right. Okay. But if you sort of, you'll have less steps. So it probably adds up being the same, but you're not going to, if you're, if your cadence is too slow, you would think that too low, I mean, you would probably think that you're getting more to end range with some of your joints and then could be overloading mm-hmm. tissue that way. Yeah. Okay. So that's 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 a real particularly for patellofemoral pain, that is the best thing ever, I think, is just um increasing stride frequency. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Any specific advice on um, Achilles tendinopathy in regards to that? Yeah, that's mechanics. A, yeah, that's a that's a bugger to treat, right? I've had that myself, and that can last for months and months. Um, that is something that is managed, right? So, first thing is is once again, it's running speed, right? Because like I was saying, if you're running fast, um, you're going to take longer stride lengths and you're going to take your ankle through full mate range of, of more range of motion. You're going to put more tensile loading on that Achilles tendon. So the first thing is the, to stress the importance of running slower. And that includes... Uh, elimination of um, any sort of speed work or track work, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, so a lot of runners, they want to get faster, so they'll go up to the local high school track and they'll run repeat 400s or repeat 800s. And that's a very effective way of actually getting faster, but it's also going to really stir up your Achilles tendon. So you really have to pull back on the speed work and then have them substitute that interval work for perhaps on a bicycle or an elliptical or something that's not overloading the Achilles tendon, right? So it comes back to that tissue loading thing. So you got to slow down. I mean, you can run through an Achilles tendinopathy, right? Um, and I assume we're talking about the mid-belly tendinopathy, right? Just in the tent. Okay. Um, you can run through those, but... You have to slow down. Second thing you need to do is you need to use a training shoe with a higher heel toe drop, right? Mm-hmm. In other words, the heel is elevated a bit. That will help a lot too and stop that tensile load on the Achilles tendon. Um, the third thing is you really need to hit the strengthening component also. So I often find that people with Achilles tendinopathy have weak hip extensors, right? So they really need to start working on their hip extensors as well as actually strengthen the whole chain. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think there's been a movement away in the research um, recently. I mean, years ago, they used to do the, for someone with Achilles tendinopathy, used to do the heel drop program, you know, a lot of eccentric heel raises, There's a bit of a movement away from that as far as I understand to doing actually just more significant whole chain strengthening where you've got to load that tendon up with strengthening to loads quite significantly more than what it might find in just in what you do during the day. So heavy lifting is the other way to go too. Once again, without flaring up the Achilles tendon. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's lifting shoes and then running load. That's my three-step approach. And patience. I mean, it's hard to, 
it's you've got somehow you've got to there's you got you got to let the the therapist know there's no quick fix for this right because you've got it's tendon remodeling and it's going to take time but you can run through it i mean there have been some very famous runners in the past that have won all sorts of events with a pretty hot achilles tendon mm -hmm. but you'll pay for it afterwards that's what i was gonna say is it really worth it well to them it is <laughs> yeah yeah to them it is because they've cut they've done everything else it's one little achilles tendon has let them down i've had my issues in the past with the achilles tendon also and it would flare up with it would flare up i used to run on the track by wearing flat athletic spiky shoes that would flare the achilles tendon up for sure that and the combination of running harder and like if you're thinking ideally if uh, when would you recommend them going back to running if you could just you know in a perfect world where they are not rushing to go back we're talking about tendon yeah so mm -hmm. i sort of look at a couple of things i look at okay you start your training run how does it how does it feel when you start running most people it will feel a little stiff and sore but as they get going it sort of goes away then it might be a little stiff and sore the next morning for those people i would just maintain the same running do you know what i mean until they weren't having any pain when they started their run right then you can increase and progress back so i would i would look at that stiffness and pain that they're having so it's so it's, i guess it's what i'm saying is it's symptom dictated yeah okay uh since we start talking about specific injuries um how about plantar fasciitis oh yes that's the vampire bite once you once you have that it never goes back it goes away <laughs> you're forever uh, changed i can't think of anything good. worse oh that's oh, a no. that's a horrible horrible thing to have you know yeah um, sometimes you can run through plantar fasciitis and sometimes you can't right uh Plantar fasciitis, it, you've got to look at the plantar fascia as being pretty much part of the Achilles gastros sort of system, right? It's sort of all continuous tissue. As you know, it's sort of like small tears in the plantar fascia um, that can be just quite painful. Um, so mobility work, strength work, um, stretching particularly getting uh, dors adequate dorsiflexion of the great toe is important. Ankle dorsiflexion is important. Um, orthotics in this case might be helpful or taping to support the medial arch. It will go away if you can maintain, if you can keep it under control, Right, so you might just have some pain when you start running, or you get a little bit of pain at the end of the run. And you have some pain. That's fine. Keep running, but I wouldn't increase the load. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to recognize that as it's, it can get worse and worse and worse, and then there, there will probably come a time where you have to take some time off running. Right. Now, those people that have pain and they they have a lot of morning stiffness in their foot and ankle when they get out of bed sometimes they'll benefit from a night splint which will just hold their foot in dorsiflexion while they're sleeping that'll be helpful that they're not as popular as they used to be but those people that have that morning pain that can be that can be beneficial right um i wish i had the magic answer for that uh low extremity strengthening also and and patience Mm -hmm. And any advice specific like on shoes or mechanics? Um, I think a shoe that once again, perhaps with a slightly higher heel, right? Because you can take some tensile load off that system. 
uh, a shoe that feels a bit more supportive under the medial arch might be helpful for some people. Um, I think the best thing to do with plantar fasciitis, though, is to is just run as symptoms determine and then cross train. Like the you can get a lot of a benefit from an elliptical as long as it's not bothering your heel, mm-hmm. right? But I've had plantar fasciitis so bad that it hurt when I did spinning class. You know, I've had it. I haven't had it for years, thank goodness. But I've had it bad. Like I was on crutches for a day one time yeah, from plantar fasciitis. Bad. Yeah, that is bad. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It, I went for it a can morning be very run. challenging. Yeah, I went for a morning run, came back, sat down, took my shoes off and stood up and couldn't, couldn't bear weight. Not good. No, not, <laughs> not good. good. Yeah, not, that's not fun. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay, moving on, patellofemoral pain syndrome. Okay, um, once I think when it comes to running, I think it's cadence, right? I think yeah, that's really yeah. important. I think um, I think Brian Hendershite, who's I think he's in Wisconsin somewhere, I think he did some research on this and showed that, like I said before, just increasing your step count or your step frequency can really decrease the contact forces, um, the contact pressure. I think also um, hip abductor strengthening is a big thing too with with patellofemoral pain. Um, I think this is something that will settle down um, fairly quickly. And once again, I would just, I would avoid uh, running down hills probably, you know, running hard down hills um, and just avoiding those activities that aggravate it a lot just for the short term. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, I had a, a PT that came here publishing his paper on the load of patellofemoral in different exercises and that, you know, the ramp going down, the squatting, because mm-hmm. was the one that had the, the biggest load. Like a deep squat? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. So it makes sense. And then you put running, going down. Yeah, running down the, a hill. Yeah, yes. you really then is the biggest load. Yeah. Um, IT band syndrome, any specific advice? Yeah, that's sort of tricky too. You find that um, sometimes if runners, um, I've had runners, if they run faster, contrary to everything I've said, their IT band doesn't bother them as much, Hmm. right? I've also found that... um, if you run, I've had patients, if you, and I had a, I did a case series on this years ago. You can have them running on a treadmill on an incline up a hill, mm-hmm. right? And they can run at a five, 10% and have no knee pain, right? Mm-hmm. So one thing you can do is actually just get their running on a treadmill for a while and put it on an incline and, they won't run as fast, but they'll keep running and they won't have that knee pain. Mm-hmm. So that's one thing you can do. The other thing, once again, is to look at hip strength. Mm-hmm. Um, and also this is just, you know, going back to the, the tissue loading and doing too much running. Um, so you need to sort of reduce the running but and reduce the speed. Speed, but like but contrary to that, some people actually might be able to run a bit faster with less pain. And um, don't run downhill running seems to bother it too, right? Mm-hmm. So to avoid downhill running. Um, yes, uh, the thing that probably doesn't help is I don't really think you can stretch your IT band, right? You might be able to improve the mobility of the muscles that attach into it, but the IT band is a pretty thick piece of tissue, and I don't think rubbing it is really going to do much difference, right? Mm-hmm. I see people who get on the roller and roll out their IT band and say they feel better, 
but I think they feel better not because they've actually changed the mobility or flexibility of their IT band, but because they've actually activated the descending pain system. Just a noxious stimulus of rolling actually activates a, a descending pain inhibition system. So they'll feel better when they walk around after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And why, why do you think if you run faster, they feel better? I'm not sure. It's just something that they've told me, you know. Mm -hmm. I guess That's it has something to do with, with the compression point of the iliotibial band um, laterally. I'm not sure. It's just something to think about. Yeah, that's different. Yeah, so don't, so yes, yeah, so I don't assume. So you might have them able to do a shorter run that's faster mm -hmm. than a longer run, right? So instead of running four miles at at uh, nine minute pace, you might have them run two miles at eight minute pace and not have any pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But the big, the biggest help I've had actually is you going uphill on the treadmill. Yeah, that's a good tip. To no. try out. No. Um, and how about medial, medial tibial stress syndrome? Well, first I think thing, this one yeah. is very common. Yeah, it's very I had common. A lot in, of patients. Right. Yeah, so that sort of blends into the stress fracture sort of research, doesn't it? You know, mm -hmm. um, because it's sort of like it's, it, yeah, so that tibial pain. Um, a few things there. Once again, it's how much running you're doing and how fast you're running, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of um, if 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 this is sort of on the on the um, spectrum of stress fractures. I was at CSM this year, and I went to a thing on stress fractures. I think Rich Willie was speaking. I think this was his presentation. And they were emphasizing how it's not so much the compression forces, the impact forces of running that stresses the tibia the most, it's the muscle attachments. So it's the attachments of the, the calf muscles and things like that that, that uh, actually cause more tibial torsion forces than, than the actual loading impact, which I thought was pretty interesting. Yeah. So... One of the things they would, would, if it's when talking about the stress fractures and this medial tibial stress, is that they were saying that um, you, you, you know, you have to really keep pain to a minimum while running. You, it's really difficult to run through, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that was sort of a long, twisted answer. But I just get back to the same old thing of loading, tissue loading, you know. And while we're talking about that, you know, this is sort of a slight divergence of the topic. You, with training load, you know, we've been talking a lot about external load, right, in terms of how far and how fast. You actually have to think about also internal load, right, what's going on with heart rate mentally and things like that do you know what i mean because for instance if a runner is having some adverse life events such as they're about to lose their job uh they got stuff going on at home or other sort of you know you know personal sort of conflict drama etc that actually has been shown in research to affect their running mechanics right so you're more likely to get injured if you're having a stressful life event going on at the same time, which makes sense because you're probably not going to sleep as well, for instance, and you're not going to recover as well from injury. So a lot of people actually, when they look at training load, they don't just look at the time, but they also look at the life events going on as well. So if you've got an athlete who's got a running injury, and you're thinking of, oh, they're, you know, you're managing them and they're recovering, you know, they're slowly making progress no matter what the injury is. And then if they've got some, some personal life things going on, it's probably not a good time to actually start increasing their training. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. that may mean they'll get re-injured. 
Yeah. Mm. Sorry to diverge that way. No, it's a it's a good point that sometimes we don't pay much attention to our. I guess there is not much that we think we can do, but if you just pay attention and, as you said, maybe, you know, don't increase their volume at that time, it's going to be very right. helpful. Yeah, and it's hard as a therapist, it's hard to sort of broach that topic with patients, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. You know, but having said that and being a therapist for so long, um, it's they tell you anything. You know, because of all the people they see in the healthcare system, you spend the most time with them. Yeah. And you spend the most time talking to them, and it's surprising what they will tell you. Yeah. Mm. And like regarding injuries, any other injury that like it's common that I didn't ask you? No, you most running about? injuries are from the knee down. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I don't think there's a gender preference for injuries, but most of them are the foot, ankle. It's Achilles, plantar fasciitis, and then you go up to the knee. It's patellofemoral pain, iliotibial band, and that's pretty much it. You don't see too much hip and low back sort of stuff related to recreational running. Mm -hmm. And like I yeah. said, it's it's you know going back to the, my it's it's just. It's loading the tissue, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, runners don't want to stop, but I think we can load them a little differently. You know, you can reduce the load and have them keep running while they clear, the injury clears up. And it's, you know, every runner gets injured. I mean, 50% of runners take a couple of days off a year for some sort of running injury. Mm -hmm. it happens to everybody. Happened to me last year, you know, <laughs> I had to take a week off. You know, so, and that was because I was running in a marathon that was downhill and I strained my hamstring and to take a week off. Yeah. So at least if you keep them, keep them running, keep them happy, exactly. more chances of them getting through the treatment. Yeah, yeah. And... The th yeah, you keep them running, but also, you know, going back, you need to establish how regular they are because the thing about preventing a running injury is you have to be consistent with your running. So you can't run for a few days or a few weeks and take a few weeks off and then pick it up again, right? Mm -hmm. You need mm -hmm. to be running regularly. So part of the history is also establishing how regularly are they running, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And then also part of the history is establishing how important is running to you. Mm -hmm. So then you know if they're in that recreational runner category or they are in the competitive category, right? Because the recreational runners are easy to work with because they'll cross train, they'll swim. But the competitive runner who's got that marathon that's coming up in six weeks, that's the one that's difficult to work with. And how about those runners that they just – like probably be more the recreational ones that just show up and start running. Like they don't do strengthening. They don't do anything. They just, you know, I'm going to start running. Uh, what do you recommend for those patients? To take it slowly, right? To look at how much they're running and to progress their running distance or time very slowly to run more to the clock rather than to uh, a speed. You know what I mean? When I say run to the clock, just run for 20 minutes, run for 25 minutes. I encourage them to be consistent, to run. Even if it's only for 15 minutes, you're better off doing that than not running at all. And like, how about strengthening? Do you recommend them to like strengthening? Oh, I recommend everybody lower. do strengthening. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the... I mean, the yes, uh, that that that's a blanket re as a physical therapist. That's a blanket recommendation for everybody. Yeah. yeah, because I think that that's like I feel a lot of these recreational runners. They just don't prepare their body. They just like okay, I start running, mm -hmm. but they don't work out. They don't do any strengthening. They don't yeah, do they, anything. Well, they yeah, I try to get them to do strengthening, and I try to sell it to them as this will make you run faster. If you run a little less right, and work on strengthening 
your ankle plantar flexors, particularly if you're an older runner, that's the key muscle group is your, you know, your calf, soleus sort of thing, right? Your ankle plantar flexors. Um, probably in older runners, they get weaker, more, they get weaker faster than other muscle groups. So the older runners, so like an older runner, anybody over the age of 40, if that preference to get good calf strength, you know, can you do 15 to 20 single hill, single hill raises, for instance? Mm-hmm. And that'll help with stride length while you're running. And if you can improve your stride length, provided your cadence is good, you should run faster. Mm-hmm. And plus it'll help I, take I, your gillies, yeah. I started laughing because I like yeah, what I you said tell. that <laughs> I like what you said. You're going to run faster. Don't talk about preventing injuries. Just say no, you're going to run faster. Exactly. Then you're going to get them to do it. <laughs> you got to get, I, yeah. I like that. <laughs> you got to frame it in terms of. <laughs> exactly. You can run faster. Right. <laughs> then you can get there by in. <laughs> <laughs> exactly because they're not thinking in terms of injuries they're, they're thinking in terms of what's the what's the positive benefit not the prevention of something mm-hmm. 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 and then yeah. you, you know all the elite runners do strengthening now yeah years ago yeah. they just ran but now they all do strengthening yeah um and then michael how about the malen principles that you apply to those uh, runners. So how do you integrate that? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. The first thing, I mean, with me, the key aspect of the Maitland approach is active listening and empathy, right? So listening to them tell their story, right? So, and then occasionally repeating back what's been, what you've, think you've heard from them, right? All right, so to make sure that the patient feels heard and that the seriousness of this, you know, of their running injury, for instance, is being understood, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the main thing I would say out of that, of the Maitland Principles, is the listening, establishing the history. Mm -hmm. And And do do you do... Um, a lot of manual therapy with them as well? Yeah, if I see, you know, if, for instance, I talked about making sure, I mean, step one, control load. Step two, look to things that would internally that would increase load. We talked about ankle, ankle dorsiflexion, great toe dorsiflexion, and hip extension. So, yeah, manual therapy and stretching directed at that, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. You know, for instance... We looked at, say, just look at ankle dorsiflexion, for instance. Um, if someone goes into that squat, right, and then they feel a lot of pinching in the front of their ankle, right, rather than a tightness in the calf and in the Achilles tendon, to me, that's a good indication that they will benefit from mobilization of the ankle as opposed mm-hmm. to just giving them stretching, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So things like that. Mm-hmm. You know, then I'd also... You know, they if if their hip extension extension is limited, they've probably got some um, stiffness around their lower lumbar spine as well. So I'll go up and work on that as well. Mm-hmm. But it's only fairly short term. I mean, we're talking a couple of sessions tops. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um. Before we transition to our final questions, um, anything else that you want to add? Uh, anything that PT should pay attention when treating runners? Any other consideration? Um, no, I think that I think that if you if you're I think runners like to go and see PTs who run themselves or work with runners, right? Because I think. The fear of a lot of runners going to therapy is they're just going to tell me to stop running, mm-hmm. right? So I think when we come to that, well, we talked about that Maitland, that the, the principle of un- listening and empathy. I think the therapist, if you don't run, or if you do run, you say, "Yeah," uh, I, 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 you say things like, 
I can see running is really important to you. Uh, my goal is to help you get back to running as your best as soon as possible, right? I will not recommend you stop running unless we absolutely have to, right? Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So I think that's, that's the first thing um, to establish that connection that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And what would be like a resource of information that you recommend to our listeners? Uh, do you have any books that you like? I know you mentioned a few books in the, yeah, um, Matt, Fitz, the interview. Matt Fitzgerald's 8020 running is probably one of the best, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I think that's just that alone. It's got training plans and stuff like that in it too. Um, for training plans, you can look at Hal Higdon's uh, website. Uh, there's lots of running, um, not lots, there's a few running courses around, you know, Con Ed courses um, that seem to be pretty good. I haven't taken any of them, but looking at what they cover, they seem to be pretty good also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Okay. And what would be the best advice you give to a clinician that is starting their careers? Oh, okay. I can go on for a long time on that. <laughs> If you're sort of in PT school or just got out of PT school, I would look for an, I look for a residency program. I would go into residency, then possibly fellowship programs after that. They've done studies of residency trained and fellowship trained therapists, and they do actually seem to be they do seem to be better in the clinic. There's no doubt about that, particularly fellowship trained therapists. So I would look for residency. Um, that would be one thing. Now that's not possible for everybody. You know, I think studying for one of the, um, specialization exams is helpful. I did my OCS many, many years ago and just the preparing for that I found was very helpful in, 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 in some of the knowledge gaps that I had. Um, I recommend that they join the American Physical Therapy Association and then the relevant academy of interest like the ortho academy or the sports academy and then you'll get the journals which will help you keep up to date with what's going on and and then i sort of look at going to i think in terms of ed con ed i think combined sections meeting every february is a great resource i mean there's i went to the i went in boston this year and there were, I don't know, 18, 17,000 or something therapists. And there's programming all over the place. You can, there's platform presentations, there's extended presentations, there's breakout sessions, um, poster presentations. You can learn a ton of these things. And that'll help give you some of these ideas and sort of motivate you. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I, you know, if you're in orthopedics, Outpatient, I think um, any sort of manual therapy certification is also worthwhile pursuing too. Yeah. Awesome. So there's well, all that. How about that? Just, you know, go through all of them. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Start with residency. In about 10 years, you're going right. to get done. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, but it is, it is important. Um always be looking for something like um, daring. That was the a previous guest just said, like if you're doing the same thing where you did five years ago, probably something is wrong. Uh, Particularly you if you're getting the same results, which aren't yes. very good. You probably yes. are. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So always trying to learn something new and improve your skills. I think that's it. You know, I've been doing this, like I said, for 41 years. I still enjoy going to work. Um, that's awesome yeah i know uh i think so and um i think it's a great job i mean it's become a little harder with different regulations and sort of bureaucratic challenges mm -hmm. and health insurance challenges over the years but i still i it's it's a great profession it's been good to me yeah it's the passion for prof the profession yeah and you can go so many different directions do you know 
um, I see, I'm in a small town, so I see a lot of everything. I've seen a lot of runners over the years, but I don't just see runners, for instance. I see a lot of geriatrics. I see a lot of post-op. I just, I see a bit of everything. I'm a jack of all trades. Keep keeping things interesting. I do see, I do see a lot more older people than I used to, maybe because I've got older, but I don't know. I just think the baby boom bubble is moving through, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Michael, if people want to learn more about you or contact you, is that a way they can find you? Um, you can put my email, I can give you my, you've got my email address. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm not on, I mean, I'm on Twitter, but I don't post anything. I'm on uh, Instagram, but I just look at stupid videos. So I don't, <laughs> I don't post anything. I'm pretty, I'm pretty old that way. But they can email me if they've got any questions particularly related to what we've talked about. I don't mind. Okay. You were just, just there looking at everybody else's posts. R right. That's it. That's it. I'm, uh, what's that, lurking or what? <laughs> yeah, I don't just, do much of that. There's that's some good, good. stuff there. There's you some save, good stuff. On... You save your time, you know? <laughs> yeah, but there's some good stuff on Twitter. I've actually got a lot of... Um, a lot of discussions. Papers and right? ideas, you know. Um, if you follow yeah. the right people on Twitter, they'll post a paper. They'll say, look at this. Yeah. Um, so there's yeah. been some, some interesting stuff, I mean, from Twitter. Mm -hmm. I have to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Michael, thank you so much for taking the time to come share all your knowledge with us. It was really good. We appreciate all the helpful insights and tips and help us be better clinicians. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me.